The first sheriff of Sanpete County, James Burns, was a tough man by any measure. In 1849, when he was two months old, a passing wagon found him clinging to his parents with both bed of cholera at the last crossing of the Sweetwater. This disease was contagious, so it took a brave pioneer woman to nurse him back to health and resume his journey to the California gold fields. As they passed through Salt Lake City, however, they found the Mormons gathering for a conference, and she presented the baby to Brigham Young, who raised him before the congregation and asked who would bring him up as their own. As luck would have it, Burns's aunt was a faithful saint and agreed to take him to the new home in Provo, south of Salt Lake City. And it was in Provo that he grew to know the land as he knew himself and quickly gained the respect of the community. He was elected the first sheriff of Sanpete County in the early 1890s. Now, Sanpete is a weird place, and the 1890s were a weird time. In places like Browns Park and Robbers Roost, outlaws would flee to avoid capture for crimes as severe as murder or robbery. They were incredibly remote and so infested with desperados that the law simply refused to go there. Sanpete County, on the other hand, wasn't that far from Salt Lake, but it took a decent trek through the canyons and hills to get there. It became a budget robber's roost where folks would go if they had beaten someone or stolen a few sheep. After a short search, police would soon say that the time wasn't worth the effort and simply left the perps alone. In fact, up until the early 1900s, parts of San Pete County left to join Carbon County with the better law enforcement that came with the establishment of mining communities and railroads there. And because he was elected to enforce law and order in San Pete County, James Burns saw it as his personal mission to turn it into a place of law and order, and it was his overzealous attitude that may have contributed to his death on September 26, 1894. Two days earlier, on the 24th, a young man named Scott Bruno sent a telegraph out explaining that a few of his sheep had been stolen, asking him to meet in Manti the following morning. Burns was happy to oblige, and the two set off into the mountains overlooking town, Burns on his horse and Bruno on a mule, mostly there as good company. Accompanying Sheriff Burns and Scott Bruno were two other locals, Bill Brewer and Neil Sieber Anderson. They rode into the Horseshoe Mountains to Reeder's Ridge. Along the way, they found sheep that had their brands changed, so that when they found a camp of two teens, it was obvious to Burns that they were the main suspects. These two teenagers were Moe and Coford and Jim Michael. Accounts vary, but an old news article claims that the sheriff was the first to draw his gun and fire a shot, which glanced off of Coford's gun, causing Shrapnel to hit Jim Mitchell on the thigh. Incensed and seeing that Burns meant to kill them, Moen Cufford drew his revolver and shot the sheriff multiple times. As he lay dying, Moen told the other three to go back to town and explained they didn't want anyone else to get hurt. The three complied, and hours later, the militia was on the scene of the killing. Tim Michael and Moen Cofford were never officially seen again, although there were occasional reports. In one, authorities from San Pete many years later, after Scott Bruno and Bill Brewer had already died of natural causes, drove up to Idaho to investigate an old man who drunkenly admitted to being Moen Coford in a bar. The only surviving witness to the killing at this time was Anderson, who saw that the elderly man in jail didn't walk with the same gait as Coford and also sang, something that Moen Coford was never known to do. Before his death, Anderson said he'd seen Moen Coford driving a freight wagon near Levon, not far from San Pete County. He actually locked eyes with him. Moen lowered his hat in shame and drove the wagon away quickly, never to be seen again. In a roundabout way, the killing of Sheriff James Burns also resulted in the last lynching of a black man in the Wild West when Robert Marshall was killed in 1925. The story goes that the sheriff's son, J. Milton Burns, made it his life's goal to track down his father's killers. As the years passed, he moved from San Pete County to neighboring Carbon County to work as a mine guard at Castle Gate, a place infamous for accepting outlaws. They also accepted black miners, and on the morning of June 15, 1925, a black man walked up to him and shot him several times. Two young girls implicated Marshall, who immediately went into hiding at his friend's cabin, although his friend somewhat understandably reported him so as not to be lynched himself. But it does seem like there's more to this story than meets the eye. Years before, in 1903 and 1904, the miners in Carbon County went on strike following the worst mine disaster up until that time in American history. As the years went on, more radical unions began demanding a socialist program of seizing the means of production and totally integrating the workforce. This culminated in a series of massacres just over the state border in Colorado, including the famous Ludlow Massacre of 1914, where authorities shot the strike organizer in the back of the head and fired a machine gun into the strike camp before burning it down, killing over a dozen women and children. 
Now, in socially conservative Utah, authorities viewed the anti-segregation socialists as the party responsible for the massacre and began clamping down on union activity in an effort to prevent similar acts. When it was discovered that Robert Marshall was actually at Ludlow for the massacre and strike, he was immediately viewed with apprehension. When the highly respected son of the beloved first sheriff of a neighboring county was also killed, the first person to be accused was Marshall, whom authorities wanted dead anyway. Robert Marshall probably knew he would be the first suspect because of his radical ties, so he fled as soon as he heard a black man shot the son of the sheriff. After police arrested him, he was turned over to the mob and driven out of town to be hanged. J. Milton Burns would be buried next to his father a few days later. The Burns family had two dead members, a father and son. Nobody knew what happened to the two men who killed James Burns, and it's still officially unknown who killed his son, because Robert Marshall was never given trial. And because of the hysteria at the time, nobody knows who's responsible for the lynching of Robert Marshall, although there was a trial and all 13 of the accused were found not guilty. A judge who was reviewing the case called it a bastardization of justice.